My name is Sabine Hildebrand. Um, I will be moderating uh, this um, panel discussion. I'm a lecturer in anatomy here, so I spend my time teaching anatomy and doing research on the history of uh, anatomy in the Third Reich. Next to me is Mr. Martin Löwenberg, uh, who has been a Holocaust educator for more than 25 years now. He's a regular speaker at the Holocaust Memorial Center in Detroit, uh, as well as at many other functions and schools. He frequently travels throughout the state of Michigan. Actually, very soon he's going to have a tour uh, of the Upper Peninsula, uh, where he speaks to several groups. And in 2006, Mr. Livenberg was honored by the Program for Holocaust Survivors and Families for his dedication to Holocaust education and remembrance. Next to him is Dr. Emmanuel Tanai. He is a forensic psychiatrist and a survivor of the Holocaust as well. He is the author of uh, his autobiographical book, Passport to Life, and he also wrote about his professional experience as a forensic psychiatrist, legal injustice, behind the scenes with an expert witness. Dr. Tanai has also received the Golden Apple Award for contributions to the American Academy for Psychiatry and the Law. Then we have Dr. Sharon Cardia, who is professor and chair of the University of Michigan Department of Epidemiology and director of the Public Health Genetics Program in the School of Public Health. Her main research interests are the genetic epidemiology of cardiovascular disease and its risk factors, and she is particularly interested in gene environment and gene-gene interactions and in strategies to understand the complex relationships between genetic variation, environmental variation, and risk of common chronic disease. And then there is uh, Dr. Jeff Ely, who is chair and professor of the history department at the University of Michigan and the Carl Ford Distinguished University Professor of Contemporary History. Professor Ely has published numerous articles and books on German history of the 19th and 20th century, and his recent books include A Crooked Line, From Cultural History to the History of Society, and Forging Democracy, that is the hi a history of the left in Europe from 1850 to, the to, to 2000. Um, at this point, I would like to invite Mr. Löwenberg to uh, talk about his experience and his thoughts on uh, the implications of National Socialism and eugenics in the past and in the present. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Hildreth, and uh, I appreciate the invitation. Um, my story, actually, or my life under the Hitler regime actually started already in 1933, when I was five years old. Um, to give a little background of our family, uh, at the time in 1933, I was the youngest of five children. And uh, my family all were born in uh, Germany. Um, matter of fact, in a little village in central Germany. And my um, um, grandparents are even buried there, but, uh, and of course, uh, my parents were also born there, but unfortunately, their ashes remain in Auschwitz. It was, time started immediately um, after I was five years old, we were already being humiliated, we were already being harassed and um, by people. And as a matter of fact, to the point where on March the 16th, which is now 79 years ago, we, um, uh, they burned down our house. We had lost everything. And whatever we did not lose uh, in the fire, 
that was looted by thugs and who immediately embraced uh, Hitler and his ideas. These young fellows didn't have anything before, but now they became uh, important people. In um, 1936, I was already being tortured by the teacher, and uh, my parents had to send me away to a school. But I'd better go back um, to 1934, 35, and 34. My uh, mother gave birth to twin boys, and we. Um, were seven children now in our family, but my old and my two older siblings, who were already in the um, in the early twenties, uh, were absolutely being uh, abused and also um, uh, uh, humiliated. And you, they used to call them, "You damn Jew," "You uh, Jew banish." and so on. Uh, this was, at the time, already the life of Germany. In 1935, uh, lots of it had been taken away from us already. The, um, we were no, no longer allowed to have a telephone. Uh, travel was already restricted. Um, times suddenly became very abnormal. For us. What? For me, what? No. All right. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Thank you. In um, 1936, um, while I was in school, and it happened to be on Hitler's birthday, uh, the teacher who uh, sometimes already came to uh, to the class in the uniform, in the brown uniform, and uh, he was definitely, he had embraced Hitler, and uh, of course, uh, he was very much against the Jews already. He had, uh, he had invited all the entire uh, 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 school um, into our classroom, and, um, and he uh, had accused me of having stuck out my tongue at Hitler's uh, picture. So um, the teacher had me punished and very badly. Matter of fact, he had uh, uh, even taken as much as a, he had a board which was covered with thumbtacks and nails and put it down on the chair and he picked me up from the floor because I had been beaten so badly by the students, and so uh, that was, for me, the last day in public school. But my parents already had a, uh, they had to send me away to a boarding school about 150 miles from home, and I was separated from my family for two years. So were many, many other children. Um, so we were, um, in, in a uh, Jewish home and school, and of course, the, the, the life for us was rather normal, except we were not, we could not see our parents, we could not see our family. Um, and this was, I uh, was in school for two years, and then we had to move. They wanted to cleanse all the villages of Jews. So we had to move to larger cities, and um, which we did. We had to, we were forced to sell our house, even though that was only four years old. But we had to get rid of it at the lowest price that anybody would offer us. In 1938, uh, I um, went. I had to make uh, new friends. I had to meet new teachers, and. I went to school in August, but in November, on November 9th, was uh, when, while we were sitting in the classroom, stones and rocks 
came flying through the windows and uh, people, um, three, or three of my classmates were very badly hurt. So um, the teacher naturally dismissed the class immediately, dismissed the, you know, all the Jewish students, all the students, and um, that day it was unbelievable how people were taken from their homes and beaten in the middle of the streets, and you could see streaks of blood all over. But that wasn't all. The synagogue was right behind us, and that was already in, flame, in flames. They had burned down all the synagogues from all over Germany and Austria, which had been already annexed with Germany. And um, all, so hundreds of synagogues were um, burning in every village. And it was sanctioned by the government, by Goebbels, who was the uh, propaganda minister at the time. They let the uh, Jewish property burn, but be sure and protect the non-Jewish properties. It was an unforgettable day. But the next morning, uh, suddenly somebody knocked on the door, and it was a policeman and a um, and uh, a Nazi soldier, and the policeman forced my father to go with him. But my father gave him an argument. He says, "I was an I was an officer in the First World War, and now you're arresting me for what?" Well, anyway, come with me, you you did. And my father had to go with all the men from the age of uh, uh, 16 or 18 up to the age of 60. There were three concentration camps already in existence. The first one that was ever built was Dachau. The second one was um, Sachsenhausen, which was near Berlin. Dachau was near uh, Munich. And the third one was Buchenwald, which had been just constructed. My father, with the rest of the men, were taken to Buchenwald. They arrested altogether over 30,000 men from all over Germany and Austria. Suddenly, you didn't see any Jewish men anymore. You couldn't go to service anymore because the men usually made up the service. You want me to go on? Yeah. Okay. No? Okay. Well, fortunately for my father, he was uh, interned for um, um, for uh, four weeks, but others stayed there in the camps as long as a year, and some never ever came back to their families. Of course, we had been um, robbed of our citizenship already back in 1935, so therefore we didn't have any IDs or anything uh, where we could be uh, if we wanted to go into another country. But it was also very difficult to get out. Um, for us, we were very poor after the, after the fire, but now um, things were getting much harder, and I could no longer go to school. In 19, um, uh, for, uh, and then shortly after, they gave us an ID card, and with that ID card, they added a middle name to our name. And for men, it was the middle name was Israel. For women, the middle name of Sarah. Then they gave us the star to wear. And of course, with that star, and it says Judah, Jew, we could not go out on the street without being recognized, without being uh, uh, accosted and abused. So we stayed mostly inside. As far as studying, whatever we had available, that's how we learned. Services were very much at a minimum. But in 1941, we got notice that on December the 8th, when 
to be resettled, not deported. We're going to be resettled. Take, have a small suitcase, a little larger than this, and put some, take some food and some uh, warm clothing. And you are to meet on December the 8th in, in a, um, a, 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 by the uh, train station. And from there, you will be taken to the capital city of the state. We, we had to pack everything. We had to mark everything because I said, it'll be forwarded to you. Our valuables, we had to deposit in the bank. Everything, including watches, including wedding bands, and so on. And then, that morning of December the 8th, the day after Pearl Harbor, by the way, we didn't know anything about, we were, we went to, the, uh, to that hall, and then uh, two hours later, by train, we, we arrived in the capital city of our state. And all day long we were there because people were coming from the entire, um, um, from the entire area. And that afternoon they loaded us in, uh, they had some uh, regular passenger cars, but most of them were um, regular uh, freight cars or cattle cars, and I don't have to tell you what they yeah. smelled like. Uh, but the stench was unbelievable. But we had to get in, and at that time I was 13 years old. All the people were on the floor, and people with children, because there was nothing else except four cans in each corner where people had to relieve themselves and every so often the train stopped and somebody had to empty those cans and then bring them back in again. That was all that was available. But we had to stand, we young people had to stand. And we started out on a Monday, December the 8th, and on um, Friday, December the um, December the 12th, we arrived in a God-forsaken country called Latvia, Riga, Latvia. And we had to get out, to get out so quickly. All the people and uh, uh, people uh, with children and so forth, they said, here, you can take the, uh, uh, get on a truck or get on a, on a bus and we'll take you there. But You'll see, you'll see your families later. Later did not mean hour or two hours later, it meant in heaven. Because we never saw those people again. They were taken into a forest and they were killed. This is what they did in Riga, Latvia for almost two years where they were killing people only by gun, not by any any other means. Actually, guns or machine machine guns or whatever they were, because they had a, they, the ditches had to be constantly dug, new ones, because there were transports that were coming in. We were taken into the ghetto. That looked unbelievable. Yes, I have some pictures of that, but uh, that somebody later uh, that I happened to get, and what that would look like, because there were Latvian Jewish people living in that ghetto, but we did not see them. They had been rounded up when the uh, when the uh, German army came into uh, Latvia in July of in June or July of 1941. And these people were taken into one area called Moscow Vorstadt, Moscow suburb. Nothing to do with Russia. But anyway, on December the 7th, uh, November the 30th and December the 7th, these people were taken away 
out of the ghetto. 2,600 people were taken and taken into the forest and killed. Imagine in two days, 2,600 people, maybe a few more. I don't know. I didn't count them. This is how everything was done in Riga. There were no tests. There was nothing. The commander sometimes took uh, somebody and says, come on with me, come on, come on with me. I like you. Why not? Let's take a walk. Well, there happened to be a cemetery right in the midst of the ghetto. And he took out his revolver and he shot every one of them. These people, uh, the one that was also part of that, uh, 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 the original ghetto, his name was Lang, and he went to the Wanse Conference, which was on, took place on January the 20th of 1942. The Wanse Conference, which was, a, which was a villa outside of Berlin, and it was the, there was a river called the One. And so the One Sea, it sounded beautiful, which it was. But there were about 14 people, top echelon of Hitler's uh, uh, government, and also doctors and uh, t uh, 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 professors and so forth. They, in Four days they were there, or five days, to decide of what to do with the Jewish question. And it was called the Entlösung, the Entlösung der Juden, the final decision that every Jew on the face of the earth must be killed. And that was the law. And it was even the law all the way to the end when I was liberated. I mean, I could go on up, but I want to give the other, my other friends also a chance. But what, and all the way to the end, the week before the war was over, there were people from the Red Cross, some of you may remember, Count Bernadette from Sweden who was the head of the Red Cross. I don't know if he was yet, but then, and there were some Jewish men, very influential people in, 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 uh, from Sweden. And they went over to, uh, to Himmler, and they, wanted, they said, we have 300, we have about 300 Jews. We'll pay you well, would you release them? And we were all the way up in Northern Germany, Kiel. And he says, I will not release any Jew because of the final solution. How about 300 Polish women? Would you take those? Yes, Polish Christian women. Yeah. Yes, give me the money. We went out under that name of the, under the name of Polish women. No names, just so many. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Dr. Tana. <clears throat> oh, I assumed that the primary purpose was to discuss the uh, connection between medicine and Nazi ideology. But let me briefly tell you about myself. I was born in 1928 in Poland. I am from Poland. And the experiences of Jews in Poland, or for that matter of Poles, was quite different than in the rest of Europe, whether it was France or Germany, because in Poland, the Germans paid no attention to any kind of uh, decency. So it was not unusual, let's say, if you took off your hat, 
because you encounter a German that he could shoot you because you were acting as if you were a friend or if you didn't. In other words, there were behavior that was just absolutely unthinkable. Uh, my book was mentioned, and I must tell you that when I read portions of my book, I find it somehow unbelievable. Therefore, I find that uh, when there are the Holocaust deniers, uh, it doesn't surprise me. In fact, uh, <laughs> I would consider myself a Holocaust denier. I deny the memories uh, that I have. Now, the, that doesn't mean that that was universal. There were occasionally, here and there, uh, behavior of Germans that was uh, decent. And remember that, unlike Germany, the Polish Jews had been persecuted from the very uh, beginning, even in pre-Poland. Poland was established in 1918 at the end of World War I, and the first celebration was extensive pogroms or killing of Jews. So that, that continued. In Poland, some Jews were assimilated, that is, that were, they spoke Polish well and so on, but most Jews in Poland were Orthodox Jews, and they were not assimilated, and they couldn't adjust. When the Germans occupied Poland, they very quickly formed ghettos. So I consider the term ghetto a misnomer, because ghetto was really an urban prison. It was surrounded by wall, barbed wire, guards, people inside were starving. If you went on the street, you saw bodies lying of people who, who starved to death. So you could hardly call it a ghetto in a sense that the ghetto was formed, let's say, in Italy, in Venice, uh, that that was separation of the Jews from the Christians, because the notion was in the Middle Ages that Jews exercised a evil influence upon Christians. But they what we call ghetto or the Germans called Judenviertel was really an urban prison. And that in that setting there was still a possibility of survival because there was a community. Once the ghettos were closed and the uh, Jews were sent to concentration camps, uh, usually these were not concentration camps. Most of them were what the Germans called Vernichtungslager or destruction camps. Uh, uh, one thing you cannot blame the Nazis for, they did not engage in any euphemistic expressions. They told you exactly what will happen, and yet we did not believe it. Do you know that uh, most of us did find uh, unbelievable what we heard of what we even witnessed? Um, I, as you have heard, I am a forensic psychiatrist, and one of my specialties has been a study of homicidal behavior. And uh, you could expect me to make some comments about the ability of people to behave in this type of inhuman manner, as you have heard from my colleague here, uh, what accounts for it. And 
the answer that I give is hate. And hate is not something that is created by a leader like Hitler, who suddenly comes on the scene and uh, inspires people to hate the Jews or whatever. No, that hate had to be cultivated for hundreds of years. And, and it was indeed uh, cultivated from the beginning of Christianity, so that what happens is there is an ever-increasing amount of hate. Now, hate is a unique emotion. It's an emotion that, first of all, deprives you of the capacity of empathy. You know, I will ask sometimes a person, have you ever run a squirrel over? Imagine that you ran over a child that ran in front of your car. It would be devastating to you. And yet, here, there were people who could engage in mass killing at random, people who could go home and be nice to their children, nice to their dogs, uh, whatever. So this is a unique feature that I think has not been adequately studied. You know, you pick up books on uh, genocide, and I look in the index, and I will not find the word hate. And when I find the word hate, I find that it is confused with anger. And anger and hate has don't have much much in common. Uh, so really what we need to focus upon when we discuss uh, medicine, uh, the, the ethics of medicine did not apply because a belief system was supreme. And all genocides start with the genocide the first genocide of uh, 20th century, the uh, genocide of the Armenian Christians, uh, all start with hatred that has been cultivated for centuries. Uh, and that is the main theme of my book, and I hope that some of your questions will address that particular issue because I think we need to guard against hatred. And let me conclude by saying, how does it come about that people develop hatred? If you are a believer in ideology or religion, there are certain expectations of you which you can never live up to. If you are an Orthodox Jew, you can never live up to all the requirements. If you are a Muslim, you are subjected to... I read a book not too long ago called Infidel, written by a, a Muslim woman that really distressed me. Uh, you are subjected to a lot of oppression. So the, the point I am making is, it is a ide ideology or a religion is oppressive of the believers. And the believers accumulate rage. And the rage has to be displaced unto somebody else. Imagine just a little infant. A little infant lives in two stages, bliss and rage. An adult develops in between stages. However, people who are very much involved either with a religion or an ideology, the point is, if you live in sin, your 
are accumulating rage and you need a scapegoat. The Jews were ideal scapegoats for Christianity for centuries. The women are ideal scapegoats for Muslims. You know, if you read anything that describes how women are being treated, it's horrifying. Uh, but how does it happen? These are hu fellow human beings. Again, my answer is hate. And let me conclude with one thing. I became a consultant to the German government on the, um, what was called a compensation of survivors. Compensation, can you hear me now? Okay, compensation of survivors. So that means that I examined hundreds of survivors and heard some of those, some horrible stories. One image that comes to mind, I remember examining a woman and then shaking hands with her and observing that in here she had a spastica, a scar like a spastica. And I asked her, what, what, what is this? And she said she worked, had a big injury, and a physician who sutured her, sutured her in such a way that he made a, a spastica, a Hakenkreutz. Again, you know, this is sort of unimaginable to someone who is a physician like I am. Uh, how this can happen? It is not something that could be accomplished in a few years. It is something that has to be, let me repeat myself, cultivated over centuries. And what we faced in the past was ideological, religious, and we are still facing it vis-a-vis -vis the Islamic world, which after all does not make it a secret that the infidels have really no right to live. And the problem is that the technology of killing has greatly improved to a point, you know, Einstein said that he didn't know if there would be a third world war, but he knew that the fourth, number four, would be fought with sticks and stones. And let me tell you, those 19 who dropped, who brought the Trade Center down, if they had one of those little Russian atomic port portable uh, weapons, I assure you they would have used them. So I survived because I was very optimistic and I was fight fighting for my life. And it's a complicated, long story. I must say I am not so optimistic now for the future of humanity. And on that unhappy note, I'll stop. Thank you very much, Dr. Tanai. If you could now ask, uh, okay. Uh, Dr. Elias, if you could go on with me. Thanks, uh, for that draconian warning. Um, uh, what I thought I'd do in the short time available is to uh, try and provide some larger, is everybody here? Is it okay? To provide some larger context for the topic of the exhibit uh, that provides the occasion of this panel, uh, namely the relationship between Nazism and eugenics, deadly medicine. So how do German historians uh, seek to make sense of this relationship between uh, Nazism and uh, the practice of medical science? So the question that I'll, I'll, I'll try and give you some um, illumination for 
And probably uh, the single most important organizing concept for that uh, effort on the part of historians um, uh, uh, you know, to make sense of this question has been that of the racial state, which was the racial state, which was the title of a key book published by two historians called Michael Burley and Wolfgang Dippermann about 20 uh, years ago. And in some ways, the, the, the strongest um, logic of that work, which is now extraordinarily uh, stick on the ground, uh, we've learned an enormous amount about these questions in, in, in the meantime. And in some ways, uh, the, uh, the, most, the strongest logic to come out of that work is a new uh, periodization for understanding the Third Reich, which moves the attention away from 1933-45 per se, to the early to early 20th century in general, between uh, the fin de siècle and the 1930s, um, while treating anti-Semitism as uh, part of a much larger turn toward racial science during that period. Now, whatever else fed into the discursive mix, uh, so to speak, such as uh, the much older patterns of Christian enmity against Jews and Judaism, or the rural and small town grievances against Jewish middlemen and, and dealers, this complicated interrelationship with many varieties of emergent race thinking, I think has become uh, where German historians try to begin uh, uh, addressing this uh, question. So that complicated interrelationship between anti-Semitism and many varieties of emergent uh, race, race thinking in the early 20th century has become sort of axiomatic for, German, for historians of the German right, especially, but for German historians uh, in uh, trying to address these questions. I think by uh, the 1990s, uh, it became generally accepted that the distinctive anti-Semitism of the early 20th century in Germany could no longer be separated from this new prevalence of racial thought. And I want to say something. That's really what I want to try and uh, illuminate in the, in the next uh, few minutes. Now, associated especially with an extremely influential German historian who, dry, who died uh, tragically uh, um, at, at an early age in 1990, called Detlef Poikert, associated especially with Detlef Poikert, this approach connects to a wider complex of scholarship on the genesis of the final solution from the spirit of science, which was, which was the title of an extraordinarily influential essay that Poik had originally published in the mid-1980s. The genesis of the final solution from the spirit of science. Latent uh, with the influence of uh, Michel Foucault, uh, then already uh, permeating histories of social policy, social administration, and social reform, Poikert's thinking was more consciously shaped by a Weberian conception of bureaucratic and managed modernity. Bureaucratic and managed modernity. He stressed the totalizing logics and associated ambition inscribed at the center of the modern scientific outlook. This was moved by a desire for limitless uh, governmentality, Poikert argued, an ideal of systematicity, a drive for the comprehensive reordering of the social world. Linked to the emergent uh, social uh, influence of professional expertise and the new interventionist capacities of the state, particularly in the realms of welfare, criminology, schooling and health, the resulting practices of social discipline necessarily engendered elaborate mechanisms of inclusion and exclusion. Where organized by ideas of race, as in the growing eugenicist complex in the biomedical sciences or in the associated discourse of racial hygiene in early 20th century Germany, the instituting of such boundaries know who belongs in society and who doesn't, uh, could begin to affect vulnerable populations with dangerous and even deadly force. 
after Poikert's work, the most fruitful perspectives on anti-Semitism have linked it to this wider disciplinary or biopolitical complex of normalizing social, societal ambition, the, the ambition to remake society in the name of science. Now, set in this deeper context of relentlessly aggrandizing racial thought, Nazi anti-Semitism reappears as only the most virulent version of a more elaborate biopolitical drive for the naturalizing of all social phenomena under the sign of race. Now, a convergent historiographical uh, contribution came from women's history on the study of Nazism during the 1980s, signaled by uh, an extremely important anthology in 1984 called When Biology Became Destiny, when biology became destiny, which pioneered seeing biological politics as a unifying principle of Nazi governing practice, defining the Third Reich's political imaginary as doubly ordered around the naturalized poles of biological distinction, male, female, Aryan, non-Aryan, in a social order founded on race and gender, uh, one of the volume's contributors, Claudia Kunst, later showed in the general history of women under Nazism, uh, showed in compelling detail how these two categories became logically mixed up together, logically imbricated together, given the, the centrality of sexuality, family, and reproduction for each, you know, for gender and race, given the centrality of sexuality, family, and reproduction for each, the process of founding one's grasp of society on a biologically constructed concept of race had immediate consequences for how the place of women could be understood in the 1930s. Now, in those terms, Nazi racial policies do seem to have been strongly prefigured in the longer period since the turn of the century, in the early 1900s. They crystallized amidst a wide complex of policies affecting reproduction, originally mooted in the late Kaiserreich before 1914, including all aspects of family welfare, maternity, and infant health, linked to ideas about positive and negative eugenics, sterilization, and euthanasia. Ideas of eugenicist social engineering became widely diffused among social policy and healthcare professionals long before the Nazis themselves had entered the scene. Population policies seeking to fix women into their reproductive functions convened biomedical knowledge, proposals for public health, and racial thought on the ground of social policy, policies that prioritized family, and motherhood. At every point, the Third Reich's anti-Jewish legislation invoked exactly the same system of practice and drew on the same accumulating body of uh, ideas. Nazi targeting of the Jews found auxiliary authorization in that longer tradition of racial come social hygiene. In this broader context of the biomedical sciences, as an ideological field then, Nazi anti-Semitism emerged as the most vicious and comprehensive of the attempts to medicalize or biologize various forms of social, sexual, political, or racial deviance. And that's a quotation from another extremely important book of the late 1980s by Robert Proctor called Racial Hygiene. Medicine under the Nazis. Now, these ideas, this this um, invitation to us to consider Nazi anti-Semitism anti in this broader context of racial thought and racializing thought in biopolitics in the early 20th century, these efforts were greeted not without unease and controversy. After the 1960s and the 1970s, when enormous commitment was expended on the uniqueness of the Nazi war against the Jews, which sacralized the Holocaust and walled it off against comparison, mainly, this resituating of anti-Semitic ideas inside much larger traditions of racial thought could easily be seen as a kind of a 
inclusion of German responsibility. But in the main, these were uh, extremely important good faith efforts that have transformed the ways in which German historians now approach the historiography of the Third Reich. Um, and um, uh, in large part, it's about, it's a, it's, it's about a, a, a continuing desire on the part of German historians to try and create a conceptual framework of continuity and comparison that allows us to uh, not to uh, you know, diminish the awfulness of Nazism as the Third Reich, but to provide means of understanding how it could uh, grow from various kinds of what at the time were normality, and in this case, normal science. And that's what I do. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Kavir. What a segue. Normal science. Um, first, I wanted to, to say thank you for inviting me, and um, also to the, the grandfathers on the panel. You were one of the reasons I said yes to speak. The, um, you know, uh, for at least for me, I'm very grateful to hear your words and stories and understand it. Um, you know, so I, I come into this from a very different perspective. Um, my background is in human genetics and in public health. And as a director of a public health genetics program, uh, one of the things that uh, I do both in my classes as well as teaching in the students is of the history of genetics and public health. So most people don't uh, recognize that in this country, you know, 100 years ago or so, when the Public Health Service was first developed for this country, there were only two offices. There was an office of immunization, and there was a eugenics office. And that was really public health. And what did that really sort of translate into? In many ways, they were very similar to the beginnings of the Nazi eugenics era. So it was, um, in a sense... I try to get people to reflect that groups of students, groups of faculty would be sitting around having these conversations as if they were scientific conversations, you know, of the same caliber as we do today. So the whole view, so most of modern statistics was developed by eugenicists. If any of you have ever used statistics, a correlation coefficient, an analysis of variance, it comes from a tradition of science that actually you should reflect on because we are often myopic about the dangers of what we're catalyzing in our particular sort of, I'll call it current or present situation. Um, much of that work during uh, the beginning of the last century ended up with sterilization laws here. You know, the most sterilizations that were ever done were in, of all places, California. California. Um, we would think a very different kind of thought if we were putting ourselves, I'll call it, out of time and space. But it really was a part of the way that people were trying to understand um, whole new fields. Darwin and Mendel and basically science as a way to uh, solve social ills was really sort of coming into its own. We've traveled a huge amount from the days when you know, at county fairs, they used to have the, you know, pick the best pig. It was also the best family. So we as a whole society were still in that mode, um, very much up into um, World War II and then beyond, where, for instance, the, um, the main branch of human genetics that we now call, for instance, the American Society of Human Genetics, um, at that time was the American Society of Eugenics. And there was a transformation in the field to get away from that concept of eugenics and into uh, human genetics as we sort of now see it, do it, um, and hopefully um, don't ever repeat the kinds of atrocities that certainly, uh, you know, could have been repeated here. Um, and I, you know, I appreciate that it's not just a single point in time. It could actually happen in other, um, either future contexts or um, if, if Nazi Germany hadn't happened, it could have happened someplace else. There was enough tinder and enough fire. So I think what I was hoping to do a little bit um, today was to maybe put um, 
some markers out on where we have some big differences from what was the original uh, sort of placement of science and social Darwinism that actually catalyzed these horrific events. Um, I can tell you, for instance, that the public health system today is nothing like the public health system of 100 years. It is not as um, I'll call it powerful or as mandated as it um, used to be. And actually, I'm much more worried about public health collapsing right now. It's being unfunded and even basic services and basic things that we think of as reasonable precautions like, I don't know if any of you know, the helmet laws have basically been repealed. Um, so actually public health itself is losing ground. What is gaining ground and probably is one of the places where we are uh, at risk is that the free marketplace actually is driving a lot of science. So in genetics, there is an awful, um, I'll call it big temptation by the general public and by businesses to sell what is basically the idea of the prediction of the future. As, as human beings, we all want to know kind of like you know, who we are, you know, where are we going, you know, what is it that I can get the information now to do a better job of predicting or creating a better future. Um, we are at the, uh, in a sense, launch point of a new revolution in genetics that has never been at our, I'll call it, fingertips. Uh, the ability to do whole genome sequencing is here, it's now. There are discussions about even integrating it into things like newborn screening, which is a public health genetics program. It's basically the only public health genetics program. The main emphasis of the last, I would say, 40 or 50 years for genetics and public health has always been about identification and then prevention. So how do you stop babies who could, you know, very well die or uh, be significantly debilitated from living that kind of life and instead give them a new lease on life. So we have, I'll call it, more miraculous ability at our fingertips to do good. We also simultaneously have been building the same kind of technologies that in a different political climate, uh, especially one in which uh, let's say politics was forged um, around hate, it could turn, no doubt. Uh, so what am, I, what am I talking about? So we now have uh, easily machines that can create hundreds of thousands or millions of embryos a day. That's a part of the technology that is developed around infertility. If you match that up with genetic screening, you could do things that were never intended. Um, you know, to that end, I think that there are ways in which some of the view of the past has changed fundamentally the way that we try to teach issues around uh, differences, cultural differences, racial differences, that there is, a, a, at least in our school and in the profession itself, an emphasis on equity for all and an emphasis on how do you actually deal with the grand variety, and some of it can be um, off-putting, um, but the sort of whole conception of structures to prevent misuse. So there's educational structures, there's laws to prevent sort of uh, inaccurate advertising of genetics. Recently, there's been a whole boom of genetics sort of testing for uh, attributes that are not, not, not necessarily genetic. And so the pushback that says, you can't do that. Um, there are also alliances. You know, one of the great ways to stop um, fires from starting is alliances across either unlikely or likely partners. So organizations like Genetic Alliance that actually pull together thousands of rare genetic disease groups together to have a voice in Congress, to have a voice in communities and in legislators, um, sort of uh, offices. I think the, the places that we um, know we still have a long way to go is in um, trying to undo uh, a legacy of, of racial ideology. 
uh, in this country that has been, for a lot of different reasons, confounded wow. with genetics. So we have a lot of work still to do, but I think that there are a lot of ways in which um, if we are continuing to teach a kind of um, empathy and tolerance, and actually the celebration of those within public health and especially within genetics, then we, we don't run as high of a risk. One of my very favorite examples, and I'm, um, I'm very sorry, I cannot remember the name of the, it was a New York fashion photographer who one day was sitting on a bus next to a woman with albinism. Long blonde hair, just incredible looks. And this woman was incredibly depressed and withdrawn because in her daily experience, her particular genetics made her an incredible outlier. And he actually um, started a whole program going around the world uh, photographing people with albinism and with other genetic disorders. And in that simple act of recognizing, acknowledging, and celebrating the difference transformed not only their lives, but then also the lives of many of the villages he visited because they didn't understand albinism. They thought it was due to infidelity. They thought it was due to other kinds of forces like the gods and that it wasn't something that should be tolerated. So people were being ostracized. Um, so while um, I, I absolutely think that we still have many risks, I also think that there are things that we are doing uh, that in a sense, um, at least give me more hope that we're not going to go back there. Thank you very much, Dr. Cardia. <laughs>